Hi, Michael. Hi. Today we have a question uh, that says, uh, the purification of the mind also includes a development of certain qualities, humility, compassion, etc. While we are still on the way to being able to totally attend to ourselves for who we, re who we really are? Yes. Um, purification of mind means the, um, the, impurity, the impurities in our mind are all our desires, attachments, likes, dislikes, and uh, so on. What draws our mind to go outwards, all the desires that draw our mind to go outwards, they are the impurities in our mind. So purification of the mind means that these, that these desires and likes and dislikes, um, they, to the extent that they are reduced in strength, to that extent our mind is purified. So when we are um, following the path of self-investigation and self-surrender, we're trying to turn our mind within. Every time we turn our mind within, we are weakening the inclination to go outwards and strengthening the love to go inwards. So this is how purification of mind is achieved. Um, all the bad qualities, such as... Um, um, pride and lack of uh, and greed and lack of compassion, all these, all, all the bad qualities of human nature are, are driven by our outward going desires and attachments. All, all the bad qualities uh, originate from our desires. If we've got very strong desires and attachments, we'll be greedy, we'll be selfish, we'll be um, uh, we'll be proud, we'll lack um, kindness and compassion. So to the extent that our desires and attachments are reduced in strength, in other words, to the extent that our mind is purified, to that extent will the bad qualities recede and the good qualities will naturally take their place. We'll be humble, we'll be compassionate, we'll be generous. All the good qualities will naturally come with purification of mind. But that doesn't mean that we can necessarily judge people from their outward actions. But to a certain extent, we, we can, we can if, if, a, if we see a person is acting in a way that is very greedy or selfish or um, uh, self-centered or whatever, we can infer pretty, um, pretty uh, reasonably but their mind is full of strong desires and attachments. There are some people nowadays who like to claim that they are enlightened, but they say that their, they, their um, enlightenment cannot be judged by their behavior because they behave in all sorts of ways, um, inappropriate ways. Um, it's true, we, can, we cannot judge from outward actions who is enlightened or not, but if a person is enlightened, that means their mind is very pure. They're not going to be greedy. They're not going to be um, driven by desire for accumulating wealth or for, um, for sensual pleasures or for exploiting people. So um, though we obviously cannot, we, we, we're in no position to judge who is enlightened or who is not. We, let's say we cannot judge who is enlightened, but we can pretty, we can, in many cases, we can, uh, we've got very strong reason to believe that someone is not enlightened. So, um, generally speaking, the pure of a mind, the better, the, the, the more good qualities a person will, uh, will, will, be, will be seen from their behavior. But, of course, that is not our aim. Our aim is not to judge others. We shouldn't be concerned about others. We should be concerned about ourselves. And our aim, the, these good, the good qualities that come are a byproduct. They're not our aim. Because, um, um, our aim is to find out what we actually are. What we actually are is beyond all qualities, good qualities or bad qualities. It's the state of, of um, absolutely pure awareness, infinite awareness, infinite happiness, infinite, um, infinite being. So it's beyond all uh, qualities. 
And that is what we are seeking to know. But on the way, while we're following the path, as the mind gets purified, the good, quali the good qualities will naturally blossom. And another reason why we shouldn't be looking for, um, we, uh, attaining good qualities shouldn't be our aim because we, we are, so long as we are following the spiritual path, so long as we are investigating and trying to find out what we are, we are undergoing a process of purification. Sometimes, for example, if you've got a, a dirty cloth, the more you clean it, the more, the more visible the, the, um, the deeply ingrained stains become. When the whole cloth is dirty, we can't tell which bits are, are more stained and which bits are not stained. But if we clean it, as the dirt comes out, the, the first, the, um, the less deeply rooted dirt comes out. So there'll be some bits of the cloth will become more or less white, but the other bits be, will still be very stained. So the stains become more clearly visible, the purer the, the cleaner the cloth becomes. Likewise, the more our mind is purified, the more uh, clearly the impurities will stand out. So we cannot even judge about ourselves to what extent our mind is purified. It may seem to us but um, some of our desires and attachments are even strong, are stronger than they were in the past. But that is just because we are able to recognize them more clearly. It doesn't necessarily mean that they've got stronger. It could be just that they, uh, because our mind has been purified, the impurities stand out more clearly. And Michael, for example, if you have those good qualities that you mentioned, uh, for example, if you have, you develop uh, compassion, humility, and those things. I mean, the people who develop that, that are, I guess that they're not even aware of that. Or they, they I mean, the ego doesn't show up and says, yeah, yeah. oh, I, I'm, I became compassionate. Yeah. I'm getting more compassionate than I used to be. And I'm... Yeah. <laughs> yes, we, we, yeah? we, may, we may not necessarily recognize it. And also, we... We shouldn't take pride in any good qualities we have. I am a very humble person. If we think like that, that is an ego. <laughs> so a truly humble person will not even think I am humble. So, um, and likewise, the truly compassionate person won't feel compassionate. They'll feel it's just natural to, be, to care for others. So the, the, the good qualities, will be experienced as very natural, not as anything special. You mentioned, Michael, that the more desires that people have, yes, it, it can be linked to the, the to having more, uh, more of those bad qualities, so to speak. Is that yeah. because uh, people who have strong, untamed desires are going to do anything to get them accomplished? Those yes. desires, and maybe they have to to step on people, to do bad things, to get those... Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, if, if, you've got, if, if your desires are extremely strong, you will do anything to fulfill your desires. That will make you inconsiderate of others. My desires are alone important. Your desires don't matter. That sort of attitude will be there. So yes, naturally, the stronger our desires and attachments, our likes and our dislikes, the more they, they will manifest in the form of bad, qual bad qualities. And we can interpret, for example, uh, other things that we, we wouldn't look at them as desires. For example, if I have a conflict with someone, with my yeah. brother or with a friend or, some, or someone else, we could interpret that in terms of desire. I mean, I mean like, even though I have conflict, it's because I have the desire for him to be different or we can basically sum up everything or we can boil down everything to uh, desires or, or aversions. I mean, any yes. conflict that we might have in our mind. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. If, if we had no mm -hmm. likes or dislikes, we wouldn't get into a quarrel with anyone. They may try to quarrel with us, but we will be least indifferent to... to it won't matter to us whether, we, uh, whether they want to quarrel with us or not because we won't have likes or dislikes.
But at the same time, when we're acting in the world, in the world we've got a certain role. And we have to act appropriate to the role. So sometimes we ha have to, um, though it's said you should turn the other cheek when, uh, when confronted with evil, where people persecute us, that may be true in some cases, but not in all cases. If we see, um, if we see uh, an injustice being done, and if we're in a position to, um, to oppose that injustice effectively, we should oppose it. So it's, it, there's no simple um, answer to how we should behave in the world. But that is not, our behavior is not, the behavior follows the condition of our mind. If our mind is pure, our actions are likely to be pure. Sometimes even Bhagavan got angry. That doesn't mean that he's got, he's got desires and attachment. It's according to the circumstance, he's getting angry was the appropriate um, response in certain circumstances. Inwardly, he's unaffected, but outwardly, he has to show anger where appropriate. So um, there's no simple answer to how we should behave in the world. But, um, saying you should never get angry, we should never feel inwardly feel anger. Sometimes outwardly, may, it may be appropriate to show anger. Yes. Mm -hmm. one, one more thing, Michael, about this uh, this topic because uh, I don't know if that's true, but uh, I read and I've heard some some places that uh, usually uh, in, in older times when aspirants would get to a spiritual path, they would have to wait for years before getting delivered the the last the, la the let's say the uh, meditation techniques or uh, or maybe self inquiry and th these things, and they have to develop through the over the years these these features of compassion, humility, and only after maybe a decade or many years, they would, they would be able to start with a spiritual practice, a proper spiritual practice. Is, is that different right now, do you think? Or is that a necessary step also? In, I mean, in, more, in a more outward, in, in the yes. outer life? There, there are many such stories. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, the spiritual path is no different in the past to in the present or in the future. Um, the circumstances are different. We live in a different type of society. If we, if we don't have the basic qualities of humility and everything, even though we uh, uh, come across the real teachings, we will not understand them correctly. We will mis misunderstand them, misapply them. So that's why Bhagavan said, here it's all an open secret. When people ask Bhagavan, is there any further teaching that you, you give later? Bhagavan said, no, here it's all an open secret. What is, it? What, what is said is all that is to be, has been. But though Bhagavan has revealed everything so openly, very few people really understand what Bhagavan has taught. Not that Bhagavan is difficult. Bhagavan is actually, what Bhagavan has taught is, is extremely simple. But so long as our minds are complicated, we won't, we won't understand Bhagavan's teachings as they are. We won't recognize the, the simplicity and clarity of them because it will be clouded by our um, unclear mind. Yeah. About this topic, there's one more thing I was going to say earlier um, about desires and bad qualities. Desires are... Uh, uh, connected with bad, we can explain the connection between desires and bad qualities in two ways. One is, if we've got strong desires, we will do anything to fulfill our desires. So we, we will be ruthless in, try, in, in seeking to fulfill our desires. That's one thing. The other thing is, the stronger our desires and attachments, our likes and our dislikes, the more clouded our mind is. And in a clouded mind, there will be less, the, 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 the qualities such as uh, compassion and kindness will be completely obscured. Um, 
Whereas the more the mind is purified, but that is the more the desires and attachment get reduced in strength, the more our conscience will be pricked. The more we'll, uh, we, we, we'll find it difficult to see any person suffering. If we see suffering, we want to do something to alleviate it. But when the mind is very clouded by desires and attachments, it's indifferent to the suffering of others because it's, it's, it's clouded by its own uh, desires and attachments. So purity of mind also means clarity of mind. Impurity of mind, of mind means lack of clarity or clouding of mind. But, yeah, I think we, we, can all for, we can all speak for ourselves. I mean, through experience, by experience, that yes. we, when our desires grow stronger, we can feel that our mind yes. is... is Cloudy and yes. and um, one other point, the term used in Sanskrit for purification of mind is chitta suddhi. Suddhi means purity or purification. It can mean either. Chitta means mind. Um, in some contexts, it means mind in general. But the more specific meaning of chitta, uh, of chittam, is the will. So purification of mind means purification of the will. When the impurities of the mind, as I say, are the desires and attachments, when they are reduced in strength and the love just to, to be calm and peaceful and to be as we actually are, when that increases, that is the purified mind. So it's the, it's the, the purities or all, the, sorry, the impurities all exist in our will. And we, so it's our will that is being purified. Though we say the mind, which part of the mind is specifically the will? That is, sometimes the mind is the will, exactly. The, the mind is sometimes described as the antakarana. Antakarana means the inner instrument, and it's said to consist of four parts mind, which in this context means the, the thinking, the perception, the memories, all the grosser functions of the mind. That's a manamaya kosha. The, intellect, the buddhi or the vijnanamaya kosha, is the judging and discriminating and um, reasoning part of the intellect. The chittam is the will. That's where all the vasanas, all the desires and attachments, they, they belong in the, they, they, they are classified as chittam, the will. And the root of them all is ahankara. Ahankara is ego. So it is ego, but it's functioning through all the through the other three. It's yeah. I I am thinking, I am remembering, I am seeing. That's the, the ego functioning through Manamaya Kosha. I am reasoning, judging, um, discriminating, discerning. That's the ego functioning through the Vijnanamaya Kosha. And the um the, 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 the intellect and the um I'm, I like, I dislike, I desire, I want, I, uh, I dislike, I, I, I'm afraid, I hope. All this is the, the ego functioning through the Anandamaya Kosha, the will, the, the chittam. Mm -hmm. hey, it pervades, ego pervades all, all layers of, yes, of, yes, yes. of the mind, and of course, yes. it's, it's the mind. I mean, that, that is these three, the Manamaya Kosha, Vijnanamaya Kosha, and Andamaya Kosha. These are said to be three sheaths, sheaths or coverings. What are they covering? They're covering ego. So ego is not one of the five sheaths. It is that which has, takes all the five sheaths to be itself, and thereby it covers its real, obscures its real nature. And what gives these layers or these uh, sheaths or the, the sense of authorship? That or the yes, stamp yes, that is yes, yes. caused by the ego, yeah. Yes. Or, or any any anything done by the mind through the will through the, yeah. yes refers back to the ego, right? Oh yeah, all the five sheaths are jada. That's they're not aware. Our, our thoughts are not aware. Our memories are not aware. Our perceptions are not aware. Our reasoning is not aware. Our desires are not aware. We are aware of all of them. So the, the chit aspect, the awareness aspect, is ego. That which is aware of all these things and which takes all these things to be I. Mm -hmm. 